Okay. Hi, good morning, Bridget. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Lovely to meet you on a beautiful sunny day. I know it's lovely to see a bit of sunshine. Yeah. Um, very nice to see you again. And um, thank you thank for joining you. me on the breathing space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, Bridget, you and I met uh, a few weeks ago on the, uh, the Irish Inquiry, the Healthy Debate programme, where you came on and you were talking about mouth breathing and nose breathing and the problems um, with masks and what's happening to students in schools in particular because of that. But before we get back into it, so you're Bridget O'Connor, you're a myofunctional therapist, which I had never heard the title before I met you, um, and you're based down in Cork and you're part of a, a dental practice that has a special focus on orthopaedics and, and uh, orthodontics, is that right? That's correct, yes, yes. Okay, so for everyone watching this who doesn't know what on earth it is you actually do, what sort of problems do people come to you looking for help with? Okay, so uh, myself and my husband work together as a team and he takes care of, care of the bones and the teeth and I try to take care of the muscles, particularly the muscles in the face, neck and the breathing muscles, postural work, etc. So I, I'm like a face, it's, it's as if I'm doing facial physio with people, really. We were very much concerned with the way the muscles of the face operate and how they're, they're so important in guiding bones and growing bones and having them guided into the, into the correct size and shape and position within the skull and face. So when someone, so when someone comes to see you, Typically, you know, why why are they coming to see you? What would be the main kind of issues that they're dealing with? OK, most of the time they're coming to see me because they've already seen Tony and together we recognize the muscle problems and they mostly present because the face hasn't grown correctly. The teeth are crooked. There are narrow, high vaulted palates. There are open mouths and mouth breathing, sleep issues, etc. So we work in tandem and um, I would really deal with the muscle function, which would be things like open mouth posture, mouth breathing. So I would have to try and train the uh, muscles of the mouth and the face to improve their ability to have a lip seal. The tongue is a really important organ in the um, mouth as well, and it's very much gone under the radar, but I have to teach uh, uh, my uh, patients how to posture the tongue correctly, and the correct resting posture of the tongue is in the roof of the mouth. A lot of people actually push their tongue out, out of the oral cavity, which uh, this is what we call a tongue thrust. So uh, I would be correcting um, problems like that. And then many of them um, present with sleep issues. So the sleep issues very often tend to track back to mouth open posture and a mouth breathing habit during the night. So I really, the, uh, I mostly correct uh, tongue thrusting, mouth open posture, particularly tongue posture, because that's the key to getting all of this correct. And then the knock ons, such as chewing problems, swallowing problems, and uh, even non nutritive problems like biting pens, biting nails, thumb sucking, digit sucking. So it goes right across the board. They're all myofunctional problems. So things like nail biting is, yes. is a problem. So yeah. can you, I'm really, I'm really interested in that. I don't bite my nails, I don't bite my nails, but I know a lot of people do. Yeah. But what, how does that relate to uh, the face and the tongue and the teeth? Okay. I, I have I have my own little theory on it, but it, it's actually referred in myofunctional terms as one of the non-nutritive habits that would present uh, to us. But I have my own little theory because we've the most sensitive joint in our head here, which is called the temporomandibular joint. Very long name, but I think most people might have heard of TMJ. So that's the joint there. And very often that joint is compressed because the bones haven't grown forward enough. So if they don't grow forward enough, they're back. And if they're back, they're putting pressure. The lower jaw is putting pressure on this joint. So any kind of opening the mouth or we say developing a mouth breathing habit or anything that would open the mouth, such as putting your nail up to your teeth, you're automatically slightly opening your mouth and you immediately decompress here 
and you give yourself relief. So um, it's, it's like an intuitive way of finding relief for this uh, because the person would find relief from it. They think that they're addicted to nail biting, but it's the relief that they're getting from the habit is okay. what I believe is the How key. Fast, uh, uh, well, I yeah. always learn, learn something amazing whenever I speak to you. <laughs> I could speak to you all day, but we're, we're going to try and keep this kind of, a, I suppose. Sure. But, but that is all related, isn't it, in terms of yes. you know, anxiety and that kind of relief that you get yes. from certain habits. Um, yes. And often it does relate back then, obviously, to the way the mouth has maybe not grown, the face has not grown and the position of the tongue. And, and so just, I know you were pointing before we started chatting at uh, a poster behind you. Uh, yeah. Or just behind you, of, of you were saying about animals and how mammals in general have very perfectly aligned yes. teeth apart from us. Human. Yes, I, I was just referring to the poster back here. You, it's not very clear now, I think on the screen. But I have several mammals. I have water mammals and I've land mammals and every one of them, like the whale, the dolphin, the uh, uh, sea leopard, uh, giraffes, you name them. They've all got perfectly aligned teeth. And there are 5,400 mammals, that are species that we know of, and 5,399 have perfectly aligned teeth. And the only mammal that doesn't are humans. OK, so why is that then? What what's what happens to us as we are you know for obviously when we're born we don't have teeth, and the teeth come in. Yes. So what 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 happens then between certain people that that they or for, uh, in terms of babies as they're growing into children and their teeth are coming in that they would end up with crooked teeth? What's going on? It's, it mostly comes down well it goes right back to we say the mode of infant feeding, and if we look at all the other mammals, they're all born naturally. It, vaginal birth a natural vaginal birth and they're breastfed by their mothers and they have a, they keep their mouths closed and they nasal breathe so any shift or any disconnect from those natural formative habits or um, formative uh, reflexes etc will disconnect us from what mother nature intended and the more we disconnect the less optimally our face grows. So um, if we don't have these, um, if we don't have nutritive feeding, such as breastfeeding, breastfeeding is an exercise to grow the face forward and down. And most people aren't aware of that. They, they believe it's, um, you know, building up the relationship between mom and baby, which of course it does. And of course it's feeding the baby, but there are many, many other aspects to breastfeeding. And one of the most important aspects is the fact that you are bringing baby to the gym six, eight, 10, 12 times um, in a 24 hour period. You're working those facial muscles really hard. And when those facial muscles are worked really hard, that's the, uh, that's the stimulus to grow the bones and to grow them in the correct direction. So when babies miss out on those uh, natural um, natural uh, habits that Mother Nature would have set in place, the face fails to grow normally. So very often uh, they develop a mouth open habit. If they have a mouth open habit, they're more susceptible to mouth breathing. If they have a mouth open habit, their tongue lies in the lower jaw. It must for you to take air through your mouth. The tongue has to lie low. And that's the completely wrong posture for the tongue. The tongue is meant to be actually adhered to the roof of the mouth and not lying I'm low. I'm always conscious of where my I tongue know. is whenever I'm speaking to you. I always start to, to think about, you know, making sure I my know. mouth is shut. But yeah, I just want yeah. to just ask you about it because I, I mean, I have two children. Um, my older son was, was breastfed. Uh, my younger son, we had a lot of trouble, and within about four months, I just I had to um, I had to give up. It just seems colicky. Yes. Yeah. But interestingly enough, actually, uh, my older son actually has the problem. He has um, he doesn't have an overbite. He has the underbite. Yes. And, you know, he's been wearing braces for the last three years. They're just about to come off, but he is a mouth breather. So there must have been something else than other than just because he he was breastfed. So I know that 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 sure. You know, yeah, so there, that's not the only yeah, no, so that's not the only factor. So when you say an underbite, 
are you just to clarify do you mean that his upper jaw was behind his lower jaw yeah okay so that that's that's uh, even though he was breastfed the breastfeeding would have given this upper jaw the chance to kind of move forward and out and that should really have pushed the uh, mid face what we call the mid face forward and out but um, chewing habits are very important as well to continue facial growth. Um, some, uh, if you if you go back, if you if moms switch, we'll say from breastfeeding and then put baby onto bottle. There's a lot of work that um, there's a lot of muscle function here that squeezes in on the upper jaw and just narrows it again. Because when a ba baby is feeding from a bottle, they're sucking. And when a baby is breastfeeding, they're suckling. So if, right, a lot of, um, a lot of babies can present with things like tongue tie, which can make breastfeeding difficult for them as well. And if the face fails to grow uh, forward and downwards, that tongue can occupy a position well back into the airway, the mouth opens and a mouth breathing habit is developed. And I want and, to really get into mouth breathing and the yeah. issues of that in a moment, but could also um, that have been forced from say, too many um, you know, um, consecutive ear infections, um, you know, where actually, and, and, and you know, very bad colds, head colds and things like that, where it became very, about basically impossible to breathe through the nose because there was so much blockage. I mean, he had a, he's had grommets put in, he's had his adenoids taken out. I mean, he really had a lot of problems in terms of infections actually in his, in his sinuses and in his the ear canal. Could that have also been part of it? Because I know a lot of people, you know, their children have suffered from these. Yeah, um, we, we have lots and lots of little kids coming into us and they would be the we always ask about ear, nose and throat problems, ear infections, grommets, etc. And it nearly all always comes down to a mid face that hasn't developed correctly and a mouth breathing. Very often that develops into a mouth breathing problem. But uh, when that face doesn't go forward enough and downwards enough, the tongue is well back. And the tongue interacts all the time for every single swallow, and we swallow 2,000 times a day. And uh, provided we're swallowing correctly, there's a relationship between the back of the tongue and what we call the soft palate. So uh, when those muscles work together, we pull on the soft palate, which pulls on the middle ear, which would be the eustachian tube. We get the benefit of a milking of that eustachian tube, hence drainage and that resolves a lot of those ear issues mm -hmm. and that's not that's not addressed you know you know the fact that that mouth that oral cavity might be too small for a, a child's tongue isn't unfortunately addressed by the medics they just say okay you've got loads of ear infections we we'll put you on an antibiotic we we'll put in grommets but they don't look at the relationship between the back of the tongue i'm feeling really guilty here because he's 15 now and he's been through an awful lot of yeah. you know operations he had several to... several grommets kind of put in and as i yeah. said braids because his teeth became very crooked yeah, and he's definitely a mouth. You know, he's going to kill me now because I've talked, about, <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, on this. But I think it's important because obviously, as a mother, you know, uh, my number one concern is my children's safety and health, and you know, looking at those things. So I think if we don't know this, then obviously yes. we're just being led by, you know, the experts that we do see. Yeah. Uh, but this is obviously a serious issue, and I, I, you know, we have spoken before, so I, I would like to like you to really explain. There are so many issues that actually come about. From mouth breathing, yes. In terms of of you know the physical and um, you know the health issues actually that arise from that. So I know there's so many, but can can you give us you know some of the classic examples of the impact of mouth breathing on not just uh, the development of the face, but actually physically in terms of our overall health? Well, as we say, mouth breathing is a deleterious habit. <laughs> there, nothing good comes from mouth breathing. And the nose is designed for breathing and the mouth is designed for eating and speaking and many other functions. So when we're mouth breathing, we breathe in the air that's in the room or wherever we are. When we breathe out, 
the oral cavity is actually quite big relative to what we would be breathing out through our nose. So we tend to blow off excess carbon dioxide. And when we blow off excess carbon dioxide, that can lead to an over breathing problem, which makes us breathe a little bit faster and faster. And as we breathe faster and faster, we tend to breathe more, uh, le we, uh, we don't breathe as deeply as we should. The breathing tends to be shallow. And when it's shallow, the movement of oxygen from the, the upper part of the lungs isn't as efficient as the movement of oxygen from the lower part of the lungs. So even though we're constantly taking in more air, we're not getting the benefit of it. But one of the major things that this overbreathing leads to because we're mouth breathing is a change in the pH in the blood. And when we blow off too much carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, the level of carbon dioxide in the blood is the trigger, the natural trigger to the brain to take in the next breath. Now, obviously that next breath should be through the nose, but if we're mouth breathing, you're going to take it in through the mouth. And when you take that breath in through the mouth, you bypass all the um, all the advantages of passing air through the nose, one of which is the nitric oxide at the top of the nose, which obliterates viruses and bacteria. But it also opens up the breathing tubes and the delivery of oxygen to the brain and muscles is really enhanced. So to speed it up. So the kind of air we're breathing through the mouth, even though it's the same air as we would breathe through the nose, is very different when it arrives in the lungs. And it's, it generally arrives in the upper part of the lungs and it's, it, it's just far less efficient to get into the muscles. So we lose out a lot on that. We tend to blow out the carbon dioxide and we begin to alter the pH of the blood very, very quickly when we do that because- So our pH- so, so pH balance is, is 7.3, 7.4, is that right? It's uh, 7.35. The optimal pH in, uh, uh, in the blood is 7.355. And the body is constantly monitoring that. It's like a computer reading the blood the whole time, saying, what is it? What is it? What is, oh, it's going a little bit over 7.45. We better bring it back. So it's got mechanisms to buffer the pH if it sees the pH creeping upwards or creeping downwards. If the what, pH, what's the impact then if it goes, if it's too high? So if it goes up to mass would be kind of dangerous. It's massive stress on the body. So as the pH increases from 7.45 to 7.5, we're moving into something we call alkalosis. And you, you, you mightn't believe it, but as we move up in alkalosis, um, you only have to reach 7.8, which is only 0.35 of a difference in pH to be dead. <laughs> it's, you know, there's, so it's, it's very stressful on the body to maintain that really narrow pH spectrum. So you can imagine the stress as the pH moves beyond 7.45 into alkalosis or the stress that's created if the opposite happens, moving into acidosis, where it's moving from the 7.35 pH down towards 6.8, at which point we're dead. And that's, that's known as um, uh, acidosis. So, and that's exactly what happens with the masks, with the carbon pooling. We're building up that carbon dioxide and the pH of the blood is shifting from its normal 7.35 down to 7.3, 7.25, it's pushing down the stress it's creating in the body to try and buffer that. So the body starts releasing cortisol and you know adrenaline and things like that. And then of course they start driving the overbreathing, you know. So we're getting we're getting a whole play, a huge stress system, you know, taking place just because we're changing the gas that we're breathing in and out very rapidly and, and i suppose that there's sort of two issues one is that people um can become mouth breathers through you know whether it's the development from lack of breastfeeding you know not having been breastfed or 
you know, so many um, there are loads know, TNT of, uh, issues yeah, or whatever, yeah. they, whatever, for whatever reason, someone has become a mouth breather. Those, you know, are now very well documented in terms of the issues, the medical issues that arise because of this overbreathing. Is that, have I understood that yeah, yeah, correctly? Yeah. Um, so, and the overbreathing is, it seems predominantly from having too much CO2 expelled from the body. Yeah, I'll give you an example. It's it's a really simple example. If you were to go to bed at night time and open up um, a bottle of soda, as they say in the US, we won't name any brand, okay? Pop. So, bottle uh, pop. Yeah, so if you open up the lid and you just leave it on the um, bedside locker, okay, and you know very well that in the morning, all that gas is gone in the morning and it's flat. What has happened Site, which is what what is the fizz evaporates during the night so in the morning it's without the fizz it's flat and it's dull that's exactly the way you'll be in the morning if you blow off too much carbon dioxide during the night by mouth breathing you'll have no fizz no energy you'll be flat and tired so it's a great example it's a great example so then we move into the situation that we find ourselves which is that secondary school students and many and many adults, obviously, in situations where their job, um, they're now being told that they have to wear a mask, could be wearing masks for hours and hours and hours on end. So one of the, um, and, and this has caused such massive contention because yes. people are disagreeing <clears throat> with the idea that the masks are reducing oxygen levels or increasing CO2 levels. So but if we've already known that by mouth breathing we're already uh, releasing too much co2 out of our systems what's happening then are, are we are we rebreathing that co2 back in so then now we're, we're not only exhaling too much co2 are we now inhaling too much co2 as well because a lot of people are being forced into mouth breathing because of the masks so they may yeah. not have been a mouth breather beforehand yeah. but because of the stress of, of trying to get air in through a mask and now they're talking I mean I know a principal of the school who double masks he walks around so he's wearing two masks you know so it's even harder so what, what's happening with the mask explain to me from a breathing point of view what, what's actually happening it's a bit like a pendulum swinging really so if you're over breathing you're blowing off too much carbon dioxide your pH is going up and you're moving into alkalosis however what the mask is doing temporarily is recovering that carbon dioxide for you just in a very, very short space. So you're recovering it, but as you recover it, you end up pooling more and more carbon dioxide. So your pH shifts more into the acidosis. So the overall effect, even though there's a bit of a balance, it's it, it's never balanced. Yes, you are blowing off too much carbon dioxide initially for mouth breathing, but as soon as the mask goes on, you pull the carbon dioxide faster and you build up the concentration more than what you're blowing off. So you really move into the acidosis side of this pH scale. But and that puts you into massive stress. Any side of the scale is going to put you into massive stress. So that's really what's happening. Now, I saw an experiment conducted with a variety of masks recently. And uh, there was an N95 mask, uh, 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 the, the blue and white surgical mask and a visor. And the recommended amount of carbon dioxide that we should be breathing in the air would be about between three and 400 parts per million. But the max is 1100 parts per million. When the experiment was done and the child wearing the mask, it was measured by putting in a little tube and there was a little meter to read the carbon dioxide level within 35 seconds of br normal breathing, and I don't know was the child mouth breathing or nasal breathing behind the mask because I couldn't see it, but within 35 seconds, that meter shot over 10,000 parts per million. It went off the scale. Within 35 seconds, the child was breathing greater than the acceptable level of 1100 parts per million 
with the face mask, the surgical face mask, it only took 10, 10 seconds for the child to reach 9,500 parts per million. And even with a visor, which we would think would allow us breathe a bit more efficiently, it reached 1,500 parts per million within 10 seconds as well. So there's no safe level. And even the WHO, if you look at the HSE website, the WHO, they, they have quoted um, from the WHO website that everybody is entitled to breathe clean air for their health and well-being. And they state that nobody should be breathing more, that the level is 1,100 parts per million. Yet, we're allowed, we're allowing our children sit for hours with a carbon dioxide level of nine and a half thousand parts per million and it's, what sort of <clears throat> and what sort of conditions can develop then you know as a result of this constant exposure the, um, you know to to rebreathing your your co2 and, and elevating those levels yeah i mean the kids get tired really quickly they get um they can develop headaches you know you've got to remember they they can over again they're starting to over breathe because that compensates a little bit um, uh, they can develop the mouth breathing problems and all, particularly the, that mouth breathing problem, it can be brought over into the bed at night time where they begin to sleep with the mouth open and then we're starting sleep breathing disorders and that's a whole other, that's a whole other um, health area, huge health area posing uh, massive problems today with our children and adults, you know. And what sort of health problems then does the, the, do the sleep disorders present? Because a lot of parents might see the, the, the symptoms of it, but not, don't understand actually this is where it's coming from. So what sort of typical things um, do those sleep just you know mouth breathing at night what what does that actually cause during the day what would what could people see okay so very often mouth breathing at night can create a snoring problem or uh, if we're mouth breathing the tongue posture is low hence when the muscles relax the tongue begins to fall back into the airway and interrupt flow and that flow can be interrupted to the extent that the airflow is actually blocked and there we are with obstructive sleep apnea straight away. So the sleep issues go from a spectrum of snoring right through to obstructive sleep apnea. And that with the mouth open, as I said, the tongue isn't glued to the roof of the mouth. So when it has a low posture, it tends to slip back into the airway. And you can have um, varying amounts of the tongue falling back there, interrupting airflow to varying degrees, the worst being complete blockage. So what happens- And that's, so happen sleep apnea is where, because the breathing's basically stopped, because the tongue has filled the entire passage, is that right? Yes. So people then wake up. Yeah. The body so, obviously wakes you up, and then you're exactly. kind of so you're constantly so, interrupted sleep and. Yeah. So we'll ask we'll ask people questions. So the body the body is striving for oxygen, so it'll do everything to try and wake the person up. It's aware that it's not getting any oxygen. So the individual might start sleep talking. They might actually get up or sit up in the bed and get out and sleepwalk. They might wet the bed, they might get up to go to the loo and say, oh yeah, I go out to the loo two and three times a night, I mean, you know, and um, they might have very tired in the morning because they're struggling for air. Um, they could have all sorts of night terrors is a really big thing with with young children and exhaustion in the morning. Um, but another another red flag that we would see, you know, they'd have lots of ENT problems. But um, another big problem we see, believe it or not, is ADD and ADHD. And we relate ADD and ADHD to interrupted, fragmented, poor sleep. And what happens to young children is they don't realize they've had a terrible night's sleep. So when they wake up in the morning, they're exhausted, but they don't have the language to articulate that. And so they don't know they've had a terrible night and they can't tell mom or dad. So they feel really tired and they feel they're about to drop down. And then they start, oh, and they're flying around the place trying to keep themselves awake. 
wow. at their huge issue. And we have had so many children in who've um, had these issues. You give them a bit more tongue space, make the mouth a bit bigger, make the oral cavity develop it to its, to its um, optimal size, get the tongue working properly in the roof of the mouth where that, that's the resting posture of the tongue. You improve uh, the airway patency. And this is all done naturally. Perfect. This is all done yes. through exercises and just yeah. training. Exactly. So this isn't done through any surgery or, no. you know, no. And, no. and what about children who do wear braces then? Because obviously that is forcing the teeth to be in a particular position. Yes. But if you're not training the tongue to kind of yeah. work with the mouth or with the teeth, yeah. what, what, what can happen there? Well, with, with orthodontics, I mean, what orthodontics mean really means really is aligning the teeth. So when people go to the orthodontist, they're going to get their teeth aligned. OK, and that's it. Whereas we we asked the question, why are the teeth crooked in the first place? Why is it that there wasn't enough room on the upper and lower jaw for those teeth? Well, the face, these dental arches didn't get long enough. The, the perimeter isn't long enough. So there wasn't sufficient parking space for these teeth. Anyone who's watching this who's a parent, you know, is probably feeling quite guilty at this point. So oh, I, I, I don't think, want uh, no, we are gonna get we are gonna get into the fact that actually this can be resolved. That that's true, isn't it? There are things it, that people can do. Yes, it, it can, but the earlier we the, the earlier we see these issues arising, the more we can do because the mid phase is fully developed by age 12. So the earlier we can get in, people are all advised to go to the orthodontist, oh, wait until you're 12, wait until all the adult teeth are um, in, and then we straighten them up. And sometimes that's at the expense of extraction of teeth. And some, some people are actually told, oh, you have too many teeth. No, <laughs> mother nature doesn't make mistakes with the mats. I've yeah. always wondered that, how can you have too many teeth? No. Surely we all have the same number of teeth. It's that the mouth is too small. Yes. So, so there is actually a parking opposite. room for the teeth. So they've actually got to come in sideways or literally jump out of the dental arch. You'll often see people with teeth protruding out on what we call, um, well, we, we use the term buckly, but you know, out towards the cheeks. And some people you'll even find have teeth that have been pushed in to the palate and mouth breathers in particular, not the two central teeth, but the, the teeth next to them. We very often see that they're pushed back into the palate because if they're mouth breathing, the tongue is down. There's no support to develop that dental arch, no holding of that dental arch and the teeth fall inwards because there is the tongue isn't out up there to support the alignment of the teeth and it's a typical we'd read it we'd read that off straight away they're mouth breathers we you know even if they come in so with you know the signs and, and obviously yeah. with the symptoms yeah. as well so um in terms of obviously the masks at school now um you know what are you seeing coming into your to your surgery <clears throat> from ch children who've been wearing masks now for you know could be seven eight hours a day and i understand that some schools are even making them wear them outside you know yes. if even in doing pe you know which is your, your obviously your body's trying to um you know we release toxins don't we through our through our breath so when we're exercising you know it's another way of elevating that kind of ex, ex, expulsion of, of toxins but now they're wearing them and they're rebreathing you know even more uh you know higher levels of co2 and things like that so what are you what are you seeing now in terms of students and I know you talked also about even the yes. pull on the ears from the straps of the masks and things like that what what are you seeing well in particular with the uh, with kind of teen females in particular um we, we we've had quite a few of these lovely girls into us who've presented with jaw joint issues and we have resolved them but we've seen um, we've seen these issues um, resurface again, and they they complain of the pain behind their ears. And as I said, the entire earlobe earlobes are attached to bones, uh, very the, the bones with which the lower jaw articulates. So there's two sockets, one on each side. 
And when those earlobes are being pulled throughout the mask wearing period, they are pulling on these bones and they're interrupting a very, very subtle but important relationship between all of the cranial bones. And none of those cranial bones are joined. It's not one solid skull. So you, you get a knock on impact throughout the entire skull and the entire face. And a lot of them have, they're um, experiencing a lot of compression here at the jaw joints and we get the TMJs exacerbated. And that is, it. The, the symptoms of TMJ are vast. You, you, you can be photosensitive, you can have migraines, headaches, neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, um, it, uh, terrible ear pain, clicking, jaw locking. It can go on and on. It's anything that interferes. That is the most delicate and the most important joint in the whole body. And it must be allowed work optimally. And anything that disrupts it in any way is an attack. It's an absolute attack on our health. You know, so we are seeing people coming in with those joy, uh, problems presenting. And some people who never presented, suddenly they're presenting with them. And we have seen an escalation of that. We have seen dry mouth, bad breath more tooth decay and um, even when people take the mask off we see an awful lot of kind of skin lesions people are getting mouth ulcers and yeah yeah me goodness me you know and then it just this seems to be you know, we're not going to get into you know whether masks you know stop a transmission of a virus yes. or yeah. anything like that because you know at the end of the day you know you and i are not virologists we're not yes. you know uh, immunologists we're not, we're not those types of experts but uh, you know what we have to recognize is that there has been many uh, studies that have shown that, you know, the transmission, the mask does not stop a transmission of a virus. So we know that there's very, very poor evidence for any benefit of wearing a mask in terms of protecting other people. Yes. Um, you know, and there are also studies to show that if you're fit and healthy, if you're completely well, you have no symptoms, you're not passing anything on anyway. So we'll just put those, we'll, yeah. we'll put those two things aside, that asymptomatic transmission you know, 10 million people were studied in Wuhan to show that asymptomatic transmission was not a thing. You know, tens of thousands were studied in the States. We you know there was a big Danish mask study that was done with about 6,000 people. It showed it didn't really impact transmission. So if we just put those things aside and we just focus on the impact to the wearers. You know, this is real. This can be proven that wearing a mask is causing health issues, mm. psychological issues, uh, you know, in terms of educational uh, interruption, it's obviously if you are getting headaches, if you're feeling sleepy, if you're feeling tired, lethargic, if you don't have that fizz in the morning, yeah. um, you know, how, you know, my, my passion is learning. My passion is helping people to optimize their brains, to be able to use their uh, innate, uh, you know, intelligence and the, the mechanisms in the brain to the best of their abilities. And what I'm seeing personally from my own practice with a lot of stress, a lot of depression, a lot of uh, anxiety, and just lack of concentration. They're just really, so if yes. you can't concentrate, your body thinks that you're in danger and you go into that. So it's all feeding mm -hmm. in, into it. I know one thing you mentioned that was really interesting was actually particularly about girls um, and women of reproductive age wearing a mask and the impact it has on them because again of the pH levels. So can you explain a bit about that? Because this is really shocking to me. I'd never heard this before. It, it's more it's more um, got to do with the progesterone levels. OK, so during during a, a normal menstrual cycle, it's divided, we we'll say zero day 14, day 28, just an average cycle. But from about day 14, uh, following ovulation, the cycle enters what we call the luteal phase. And it's during that phase that progesterone begins to increase. So in normal circumstances, when people weren't wearing masks, the, uh, fem the, the presence or the increasing level of progesterone in the body causes more hyperventilation. It, uh, the females become more sensitive to carbon dioxide levels. So they tend, the brain tends to be triggered to take an X breath a little bit sooner than it normally would. So that leads to, that leads to over breathing. So if you but this is a natural thing that happens. Oh, yes, this, this is, happens. This is biology. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, if that happens, 
so the, the females are doubly impacted then that for a whole two weeks out of four weeks, their, their breathing is already interrupted because of the progesterone, but then wearing the mask really compounds their difficulty in breathing. And it's, it's horrific to think that 50% of the students on average and second level are females and that all of these girls have to suffer on in silence, you know, um, for two out of four weeks. And, and that must be the Thank same as well in terms of, of young, you know, young teachers who are yes, exactly. you know, women. Um, so I know, and obviously in primary schools and, um, yes. you know, we are hoping and, to, to and see an end to mask teachers. wearing everywhere. But, you know, young teachers who are standing, you know, wearing a mask for hours and end as well in primary schools, all those teachers actually, you know, in secondary schools wearing them. And you know, teachers, teachers who would be pregnant, we know that when uh, breathing is, is affected, that the fetus is less, it, it won't progress normally. It'll, the, the, the little baby will be, it tends to be underweight. Okay, so not only is it impacting on the person itself, but it's also impacting on the developing fetus. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, and this isn't new information, but it's only come to my attention in recent uh, weeks, really. Um, they have now examined a lot of these surgical masks and they're finding graphene particles and silver and titanium uh, dioxide particles. And they're about a thousand times smaller than the little uh, fibers in the mask. And these particles can be inhaled into the lungs, right down to the little air sacs. And they believe that they can create inflammation because they're sitting, they're, they get stuck. They're like little needles and they get stuck in the uh, air sacs or the alveoli. And they, they have the potential to behave the way asbestos behaved because they're very similar in size and shape. And there is concern that they could trigger a, a similar cancer to the type of cancer created by asbestos. Now, just to put the record straight, 15 million masks were given out free in Europe, in Luxembourg, to people to wear. And these, they, they, they found out, I think, midsummer that these masks contained these graphene particles. And the University of Edinburgh brought out a paper to state that these nanoparticles of um, graphene, which is kind of a carbon type compound, it is carbon, but uh, graphene and the silver and titanium dioxide, that these particles were found in masks. And our own uh, independent paper here in Ireland had a report on the paper, I think it was either the 21st of April or the 22nd, but they reported on this and that there is concern that these particles could be inhaled. Now, if to err on the side of caution, masks should be dismantled straight away if there's a risk like that. I mean, you, we shouldn't even be having this debate, this discussion. No, I, I, I well, you know, I agree with you. Uh, you know, yeah. I think it's absolutely criminal that um, in a situation where young people are statistically, you know, at, at basically zero risk. Uh, uh, statistically of, of, of contracting this, being very, very sick or dying from it, um, to force healthy young people to cover their breathing, to cover their airways in any way, shape or form, um, let alone for hours and hours and hours on end. Um, and we do know from a big um, German study that about 68% of, of um, parents were reporting that yes, their children were suffering from headaches you know, lethargy, anxiety, depression from wearing masks. And, you know, the, the talk is that every flu season, you know, masks are going to have to come in. And the reality is we know masks do not stop a transmission of a virus. So what would really be the purpose? That's for another discussion, I suppose. Yeah. The reality is they are causing harm. They, they could are. be carcinogenic. Um, in terms of if people yeah. are breathing those fibres. And I mean, how are you not breathing those fibres if you're you know, you're, if you think about it, I always think of it as a, as a Petri dish on the face. Yeah. You know, because you're, it becomes moist, it becomes warm. Yeah. You know, the body is designed to exhale 
uh, toxins, if you're trapping them in the mask and you're breathing those toxins back in, it would make perfect sense um, that you would end up with a lot of throat infections, chest yeah. infections. And I do know that um, the pharmacists union in Ireland sent out a, a circular. It was not made public, but it was sent to the pharmacists that showed that there was a massive increase in uh, lung infection uh, medication. Yeah, was was actually uh, prescribed over the last year. A huge, huge increase. Yeah. I mean, um, the only thing that's changed is obviously people wearing masks. Yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit because I see a lot of elderly people um, in the streets, <laughs> walking with their shopping, no, it's, with masks, and they look like they're struggling. And my concern is, so sad. what is what is that doing to someone who's elderly who isn't healthy, who isn't whose immune system isn't so robust? And what, what could be happening to them? End of story. The wearing of a mask is breaking down our immune system. It is making us sick. There's no question about it because it's driving a mouth breathing habit. We've got these carcinogenic particles in the mask that we can be breathing in. And when we mouth breathe, we're bypassing the, the natural born killer here, the nitric oxide, the thing that kills viruses. So in a really warped sense, we're being asked to make ourselves sicker by wearing a mask. And, and the whole it, point of all of this is to save yeah, the health service. Like it just, so how are we helping as health service? So if we just no, take a step back from that and go, seriously, you know, the in, in the interest of the health service, it is in their interest that yes. we are as healthy and as well as possible, that we are not starting to overload our GPs and our hospitals with conditions that are actually caused by the mask. The mask will make you sick. And, and I, I and, and, doubt. and correct me if I'm wrong. So, for example, things like pressure on the heart, you know, things like strokes. Have, have we seen an increase of those because of mask wearing? I, I wouldn't be qualified to say that, you, you know, but, you know, we all know that um, stress, inflammation, you know, um, uh, blood pressure, heart issues, you know, they're all interrelated. So but I, I couldn't say that um, that is true that we've seen an increase. I don't know. Because but, I know that one of the one of the arguments that a lot of people will immediately come back with in terms of masks is, well, a surgeon can wear a mask, you know, in surgery for hours, you know, on end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the reality is, first of all, surgeons don't wear masks, don't wear masks to prevent viral transmission. That is not the intention. So that's not why they use for it. Yeah. But then they'll say, well, why are we not seeing surgeons collapsing? <laughs> collapsing yeah. and there, there actually is a study and it just it just escapes my mind because i've just read so much and i don't want to quote the wrong thing but there is a study done by a, um, a group of surgeons and they they complained that they have complained of terrible issues as a result of going into operating theaters and having to work under duress they you know but as you say they wear them for different reasons but they do experience the uh, lack of oxygen the, the hypoxia the hypercapnia which is the too much carbon dioxide the uh, drowsiness the weakness you don't want somebody operating on you like that but they do experience that and it was a surgeon himself um, I, I think it was um, a, a Professor Baylock, he's a neurosurgeon, I think that's who it was, and uh, the effect that the masks had on the surgeons themselves, yeah, and it was, yes, now, now that I'm thinking about it, a uh, Professor Baylock, he's a neurosurgeon. Yeah, so you have to bear in mind as well, that that's actually in the, in the best environment you can be in, because yeah. I'm actually an engineer previously, so I did design yes. ventilation systems, and um, operating theatres are clean environments. They're, they're, you know, they're about as sterile as, you, as you're going to be able to get some, some something. You've got very, very high performance in terms of filtration in the units. You've got positive pressure. So mm -hmm. you've actually got more air coming yes. in than it's actually going out. So they've actually got access to more air. And they're not touching and fiddling with their masks yes. all the time. So I think I'd like to just kind of put that argument to bed yes. in terms of why well then a surgeon can wear a mask a child you know of age 12 can wear one all day long five days a week yeah. you know that's the that's the end of it so there does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect in terms of actually really appreciating what is happening and we are seeing a lot of videos coming out now with a, an amazing organization you know teen herd 
Yes. Um, you know, where students are starting to speak out because they've been put under such a, a terrible uh, onus has been put on them of, of, you know, saving other people's lives at the, cost, yeah, and, yeah, and at the cost of the their own. And, and the reality is we need to look at the statistics. We need to look at the fact that there, you know, schools were not uh, hotbeds of uh, infections. I'm not going to call them cases, but infections because yeah. cases a positive PCR or someone who's completely well is not a case. We know another that story, another story. Another story, you know, but actually people who are genuinely sick and infectious, a mask is not going to stop it anyway. Mm. Uh, you know, I think we all would agree that if you are genuinely ill, you should be staying at home, looking after yourself, getting yourself better, exactly. not putting yourself through, wearing a mask, you know, in that situation is not. And I think that right at the beginning, you know, it was said masks will give a false sense of security. You know, that people think that if they're sick and they go out wear a mask, they're protecting other people. So, you know, we should just put all of that to the side and we just look at the impact on the wearers. And, and psychologically, obviously, we also know that this is it's, it's yeah. causing people, students to really not participate in school yeah. to the same level. The socialization, communication, so much. I mean, the mouth is so yeah. important. And I know, as you say yourself, what's the first thing we do when we come into the world? We take that take a, we take a breath and what's the last thing we do when we leave you yeah. know it's it's the last breath leaves oxygen us oxygen is the alpha nutrient you know we, we we can't go far without oxygen and to interrupt it is it, it it's inhumane and it's actually criminal to interrupt that that necessity of life life itself we cannot operate without oxygen you know. Bridget, it's always fascinating to talk to you. I always learn something brand new. I always think I know what you're going to tell me. And then you tell me something that blows my mind. Um, so if people want to contact you, I'm going to put your details underneath this video. Um, and if they have a child who's struggling and, you know, uh, particularly if they're young, obviously, to kind of get them in. But if they're teenagers and they're struggling as well, um, you know, obviously, they can come and, and uh, get some help from you yeah. around that. Uh, Bridget, thank you so much uh, for this so morning. so welcome, Sarah, so welcome. Yeah. As always, I an absolute pleasure. Because those children are suffering, everybody is suffering, and the mask is causing health issues. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, we're all campaigning uh, over the next while to, yeah. to really help people to become educated around the dangers yes. of masks and how they are far outweighing any, you know, benefit, which is minimal if if anything at all in fact it's really doubtful that's doing anything positive mm -hmm. um you know the, the damaging impact physically psychologically you know emotionally educationally societally you know it is having a massive massive impact okay. and yeah. um this is not because um we don't care we genuinely care about people absolutely we want people to be safe we want everyone we want the communities to be safe we have to recognize that um very uh if, in fact, what we've seen in the UK is no risk analysis has been done in schools. There was a, a ruling that happened yesterday um, around masks in schools. They said no child should be forced to wear. You don't have to have a medical exemption. Um, we know that there, oh, we've lost you. We know there are some rulings in, in Weimar and Germany around masks that schools were told, no, nope, categorically you're not. Um, in Florida, they've now said absolutely no masks. Yeah. They've said, in fact, uh, you know, all measures were lifted in about 50 percent of states are now open yes. you know businesses 100 percent open mask mandates have gone and instead of you know the 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 catastrophizers were saying oh give it two weeks and you're going to see cases rise and deaths rise in fact it's been the complete opposite people's yeah. health has actually improved cases and deaths have actually plummeted you know and we have to look at the facts we have to look at yes. these facts we yeah. cannot say oh just in case it saves a life in actual fact, it could be costing lives yes. um, in a completely different way. So, uh, you know, we just really want people to, to, to understand this information and to really start to protect themselves, protect their children, and really let's get rid of these masks. You know, they yeah. really are um, detrimental to, to our society and our health. So, Bridget, we're going to say thank you today, and we're going to leave it there. I'm sure I'll speak to you again soon. I'm sure you will. Thanks a million, Sarah. Good bless, and have a lovely day. You and too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.